Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Tim Lord, and I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. And welcome to the fourth annual State of the Mobile Net. Um, this is a kind of an offshoot of our larger conference in January, which is State of the Net, uh, which has been going on for close to 12, uh, 10 years now. Um, this is our fourth one. Um, we, when we launched it, uh, the iPhone had been out for, uh, like, when we started planning it, the iPhone had been out for, you know, less than a year. And um, I think that was uh, 2000, uh, 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, and we weren't really sure. We thought that we would just kind of talk about the Federal Communications Commission issues like uh, spectrum allocations and, and all those other kind of mundane uh, FCBA type lunch things that you would do. Uh, we never realized that, that this would become such a, these issues become so populist and so interesting and so different. That, that said, after, after the iPhone came out and then uh, about two years ago the iPad came out, we were concerned that there is no difference between the mobile net and the regular internet, and it was what's the purpose of having a state of the mobile net? But there are differences. There are very there are a lot of similarities, but there are differences that need to be looked at in the in the particular context of mobile issues. And we're really excited that as we start planning this thing every year, there are a lot of interesting issues to chew on. Uh, today, obviously, mobile privacy is a, is a very very big deal. Uh, there seems to be a lot of similarities between you know internet privacy and mobile privacy, but there's a lot of things that are different. Um, one of those, and we're going to parse that in the panel this morning uh, on mobile privacy, uh, one of the things that's slightly different, uh, it, but again, you know, Ashkan will correct me, um, is the same, is location inf information. Now, that's, that's particularly unique uh, to mobile, mobile privacy issues. Now, of course, there's location, issue, uh, location issues for your PC. I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, the, your PC kind of knows roughly your location in a variety of different ways, but the, the mobile, the GPS location information uh, for your PC is for your phone um, is really, really uh, unique to the mobile space. And then uh, when it comes to spectrum and uh, capacity, uh, those things become particularly acute um, in the mobile space. So our last panel today will look at, you know, uh, mobile data plans and, and the impact of spectrum and, and scarcity um, on those plans. Now, of course, um, we have those same, very same plans that are emerging in the landline space and the, uh, for it comes to broadband. But again, really more acute in the mobile space. And we're going to have that last panel of the day. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. So um, today, we have three panels, as I said. One is, the first one is on mobile privacy. Uh, we have a great uh, set of folks here that I'll introduce you to in just one second. Um, at about 9, at about 10.15, we're fortunate enough to have um, Jason Weinstein from the Department of Justice to talk about the landmark Supreme Court case uh, Jones, he's going to be with uh, Greg Nojime, um, and he'll do that for about a half an hour. And then we'll finish off the end of the day with an all-star panel looking at kind of mobile data plans and kind of spectrum scarcity. So let me, um, let me just all welcome you. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have a tons of coffee, tons of bagels. I think there's a chocolate donut that Adam Thayer hasn't gotten to yet, so please don't leave anything on the table. Um, I don't think the panelists will mind if you, you go get more coffee. Um, so, so, so please, um, uh, just feel free to do that. Um, let me start off with this, this panel. Um, we, have, we have four great speakers. We could have had about 20 on this issue, uh, given all the different players in the mobile marketplace. But we wanted to kind of look at uh, mobile privacy and, and what, is, what is different about mobile, mobile privacy um, in, in this particular space. Um, in, in our introduction, um, I think in the, in the description we had on the website, we started asking fundamental questions about what is privacy, which is, which is such, uh, whenever somebody asks me what is privacy, I'm so terribly bored by the question. But I think more and more, we still don't know the answer to that. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission is talking a lot about context. Um, uh, Professor Nisbaum from NYU talks about context quite a bit, which strikes me as kind of like it's all relative. And that's really tricky when you're talking from a regulatory or legislative perspective as, as Congress and the Federal Trade Commission and the White House are looking at it. Um, and, and so we also have a lot of uh, different players in the mobile marketplace. In the mobile, we have app providers, we have operating system providers, platform providers, we have carriers, we have hardware manufacturers, we have all these pl players that, you know, again, same, same in the landline space, but they, they seem to converge uh, in, in the mobile device in, in a device that we all view as very, very personal. So um, there's a lot of questions that we want to get to. What is privacy? Um, how, how are we dealing with this? What's coming down the pike with regard to legislation regulation? Um, and, and where do we go forward with industry best practices and, and, and the like? Um, I think the, the overview, I would say, 
is that the Federal Trade Commission, the White House, have come up with the respective privacy papers in many ways. Um, they've asked for, in some ways, they've asked for legislation in some areas. Um, they've asked for enhanced best practices, um, better disclosures, um, multi-stakeholder processes. They've kind of set a clock is ticking type thing um, where the industry groups have to get together and with, with consumer advocates and the like and kind of hammer out some rules of the road. And the question is, is that, how possible is that? Um, given, given what we don't know about what is privacy and who's responsible on the mobile, mobile operating system. So um, let, let me just introduce you to our panelists that are going to kind of hash out these questions. I'm going to uh, introduce them, ask them to tell, tell us everything they know about privacy in the mobile space in like four minutes. Um, and then we'll just ask some moderated questions and, and get questions from you. So uh, first off, we're very, very pleased to have uh, Patty Poss, who's the, the, the new chief of the Consumer Protection Mobile Technology Unit in the Federal Trade Commission. If you would ask me, uh, five years ago, whether the Federal Trade Commission would have a mobile technology unit, I'd say you're crazy. They, say, they would say that's the, that's, the, that's the Federal Communications Commission's job. Um, but obviously, I mean, just the fact that this mobile technology unit exists is a really, really stunning thing, um, in my view, um, because I've been around for a very long time, and it just stri strikes me as really, really fascinating that this exists. Um, Patty's been with the Commission for a, for a fair amount of time. Um, she, she authored the, was one of the key authors of the Mobile Apps for Kids report, Current Privacy Disclosures. Um, it, Patty's probably going to talk about um, the agenda for the mobile, the Disclosures for Privacy um, workshop on May 30th um, is coming up. The agenda was announced yesterday, so uh, Patty will probably talk about that. Then we'll go to um, Ashkan Sultani, who's an independent uh, consultant researcher. Ashkan has done a lot of great work uh, for the Federal Trade Commission. He's also done a lot of great work for the Wall Street Journal's What They Know campaign, um, which I probably got a, close to a Pulitzer. It was like a hair away from getting a Pulitzer, is that right? Good job. Um, then Sarah Hudgens, uh, she's uh, uh, with the Interactive Advertising Bureau, which is, the lar which is a huge uh, trade association of, of, of online advertisers. It's been around for, for quite a while. Um, before that, uh, Sarah was with the Entertainment Software Association. And then uh, Todd Moore, who is the founder of uh, TMSoft. Um, and, and Todd uh, is an app developer. He's also participating in, uh, in some public policy uh, work organizations here and also some best practices uh, type things. Uh, so welcome, welcome, Todd. Let me just also note that the Wi-Fi for today um, is, uh, it says top of the hill, it's, it's open. Uh, I don't know what the security is it, so <laughs> use it at your own risk. And the hashtag for this particular conference is um, pound SOTN. So let me, let me just go, um, let me start off with Patty. Patty, welcome, thank you. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. Let's scoot a little closer so you can hear it. Um, so we were asked to keep our opening remarks brief, and, and I will do that. But the fact that um, Tim didn't know about our unit made me feel, I feel compelled to at least explain uh, why we have a mobile technology unit uh, with the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC. So as Tim said, I head up this group. We are um, a unit within our division of financial practices, but we work across all of our divisions and program areas. So if you're familiar with the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC, we have a marketing practices group, an ad practices group, a financial practices group, a privacy group and I'm probably forgetting a few others, but across all of our programs, um, we're looking at how mobile uh, impacts them. So just as companies are doing this, um, we de while we have a separate unit, we're not a whole separate division. Instead, we're working um, with all of those many, many folks, and attorneys and investigators, and uh, across all of our program areas, um, looking at mobile and making sure we're um, um, we're in this space, whether it's for targeting or for policy purposes. Um, so with that, I. I I also wanted to just point out that we see this, mobile is a communication channel. And just as we've seen um, things, we've seen a lot of our same types of enforcement actions just moving through other communication channels in the past. So I see some, uh, Chloe is here who uh, you know, worked on some of our earlier cases where we have um, you know, a mail order case or an in-person um, sales kind of situation where you have a telemarketing um, sales rule um, type of scenario. Any com communications, um, any way that, that companies and industry is working to meet consumers. So, and as we move from telemarketing to the internet, and now we just see this as an extension of the internet, the, the mobile space. But there are certainly some differences. And so while the FTC Act applies, as Tim was pointing out, you know, uh, it's, it's another channel, and the FTC Act and many of the rules we enforce apply in this space. Um, it is somewhat different, and there are some unique things. So our group is looking at also making sure we're aware of what's different, what's, what's new, what's creating new challenges, and strategizing for making sure we're protecting consumers in this space. 
So some of the things that are different, and I'm sure we're going to get into them, and Tim highlighted several, but I, I just want to make sure because it, it relates to our, our workshop and, and our privacy work is certainly that screen size is a real issue. Um, we've heard it raised many times, and it's, we're not going to solve all of that even at our workshop on the 30th. Um, but the screen size creates some challenges. But for privacy purposes, there's a lot of other um, other things like this, the, um, the, the very personal nature of the device, certainly the hardware capabilities that can be put in the device, and, and are, uh, while some of them can be in a PC also, like a microphone or a camera, you're carrying it around all the time, that on-the-go use, constantly connected, the ability to turn things on um, at any time. But location is also one of those, those big um, differences. The GPS capabilities and others, that constant ability to connect with other devices as you're walking around that identify who you are and, and leave, can leave a trail. And also just the ease of sharing information. I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about apps today. Um, and many of them are designed so that I don't have to sit and type everything in. Um, uh, because I wouldn't, I don't like actually doing that with my finger, but it's also just very, very difficult. And, uh, but that ease of transferring communications um, has some implications too. Do consumers understand what's going on? So those are some of the key differences. Um, I just want to briefly, uh, I'm guessing we'll also get into this too, talk about our, our privacy report. Our final report came out last month, uh, or actually two months ago now. It has a basic framework if you haven't had a chance to see it, but it's not... Um, it's not a regulation, it's guidance um, to industry, but it has three basic principles. And the first, it, and I just want to highlight a couple that apply to mobile. The three basic principles are uh, in instituting privacy by design into your products. So um, as industry is developing, where the call is to have them think about privacy in every step of the product development. And um, the second is simplified um, consumer choice, trying to make it easy for consumers to make decisions. Don't give me all kinds of information. Tell, you know, tell me at the, the key time. And then the third is transparency, um, where you're um, making it, uh, having a place for consumers can go to figure out what's going on. But the three call-outs that are in that report that I see for mobile, um, the first two of them are under the privacy by design. And the first um, for the mobile industry is don't collect more than you need. With, in particular, um, the, you know, this is like the wallpaper app that's collecting location, something that doesn't actually relate to the need of the app. So the first call out is to don't collect more than you need. The second is a call to the mobile participants to establish standards for data collection, transfer, sharing, all of those things, use, all of those things, to establish some standards. And then the third call out is related to our workshop, which I'll just briefly touch on uh, uh, it is, it is to improve the, the uh, transparency, to give consumers clear, concise, and, and um, easy to read information about what's happening with their data. And one of the things we want to do is have this workshop on May 30th, if you didn't see the agenda, it came out yesterday, um, to talk about how can you do this? How can you effectively, this is a real challenge, how can you effectively disclose to consumers what's happening with their information on this tiny screen? Um, and, and make it meaningful so that they understand and can make an informed decision. Um, and we can talk more. I, I do also want to just pitch that at that workshop, there's also going to be a panel that talks about mobile advertising issues, um, which is different than the privacy issues. But it's how do you get, make sure consumers get all the disclosure, you know, for instance, how do you make sure consumers get um, disclosures um, when you're putting together an ad that's going to come up on the mobile space? Yeah. Thanks, Patty. Um, Ashkan? Cool. cool. So, hi, I'm Ashkan Soltani. Good morning. Um, so, yeah, I just want to touch on uh, a couple of, uh, or, or take from uh, Patty's comments where, um, so, so mobile phones, mobile devices, these are kind of these new cool things we carry around with us all the time. Um, they're a lot like computers, right? They contain your emails, they can contain your calendars, your contact books, but um, they also, uh, you interact with them much more frequently. They have sensitivities like location information associated to, to them, um, although there's various types of location information. Um, unlike your standard computer, though, they're kind of, uh, they're slightly different in that, um, unlike your computer, you don't actually control everything that goes on your on your mobile device, right? So there's a bunch of players in the ecosystem, as, as Tim laid out. There's the carrier, there's the handset maker, this is like HTC uh, or, or, or Samsung. There's the, uh, you know, the platform maker, which is, you know, Google, Apple, et cetera. Um, there's the app developers, um, there's the advertisers, and, and there's the analytics companies. And so you don't actually have complete control on your device, and so sometimes a device comes preloaded with apps from the platform maker, 
maker, from the carrier. Sometimes um, the, there's decisions made about what apps have access to or uh, uh, adver advertisers have access to that are outside your control. So there's a unique set of issues that are specific to mobile devices that didn't exist in the PC uh, space, or at least um, ha we have solved in the PC browser space, right? So, so typically on your computer, you would download a application, and it was you do download it from a known developer like Microsoft, and um, that application will have complete access to all the information on your computer. But you kind of trusted the application developer, and the application wasn't necessarily networked, right? So Microsoft early, Office in early days wouldn't upload your information to Office's servers. Um, or Microsoft servers, although that's changed now. In the mobile space, when you download an application, it could be coming from some dude in his underwear that wrote it last night in his bedroom. Um, it would, it could, it, they're typically networked apps, so they transmit data up to the, the cloud or to the, the application developer's servers. Um, there's a lot, there's not a lot of transparency. You can't right now install firewall software that prevents the transmission of certain information that that's locked down by the carriers um, and so we see kind of um, kind of a complex ex ecosystem that's just emerging it's quite new I'll, I'll, I'll support that um, but there's a lot of mixed incentives too right so you have um, oftentimes the developers of these uh, platforms right so Google for example receives no money from the sale of the actual operating system right so they receive their revenue from the sale of apps and the sale of advertisement and so why that's interesting is that in order to facilitate a you know a rich ecosystem uh, for advertisement, you need to share certain data that that facilitates targeting, right? Ad targeting. The the more information, the better the ad targeting. Same with apps, right? You want to have a rich ecosystem of apps that people want to use. You want to facilitate that the, those apps have access to, you know, the fun sensors on the on the device, the camera, and the microphone. And so some of the incentives are also mixed from the side of like uh, who is providing protections on these devices. Um, we see you know a, a few. Threads Threats in this space, right? So some of the threats come from, uh, you know, new developers that don't necessarily have good practices with regards to security. They store information insecurely on the device, or they transmit uh, information insecurely. You see some threats simply by the platform provides access to information, right? So until recently, um, the Google platform, while it provides uh, permission dialogues for when you install an app, it will ask you whether you want to permit, uh, say, location information or access to your address book. Um, they had no permissions for access to photos, right? So that was just an omission. Um, on the on the Apple side, um, with the exception of location, there's nothing that an app can't access, right? So an app can access all of the information on your phone by simply by you installing the app, and it's up to you to read the privacy policy. Additionally, um, in the Apple space, we we rely on uh, the Apple Store, the iTunes Store, which is where you download the apps from. We rely on them to curate the apps and catch kind of surprising practices or pr uh, potentially pri privacy problematic practices. But this is subjective um, in terms of uh, we relying on Apple to to do this. It's not clear um, where the where their privacy lines uh, or wh where they draw the privacy lines. Um, and I think one of the key issues is, unlike again, unlike the PC, it's not clear how much of the kind of protections for consumers or controls for consumers are provided by the platform, so the operating system restricting access to certain information, how much is provided by the Apple Store curating the information, and how much is up to the consumer. And I think there's these gray areas with lack of, you know, how much is it my responsibility and how much is, am I being curated and taken care of? And I think that causes a lot of confusion as well. Um, We're seeing some interesting trends in terms of, um, you know, companies trying to do the right thing. Apple's trying to deprecate, for example, this this uh, persistent identifier called the UDID. It's, a, it's this thing that facilitates tracking across applications. It's like a permanent serial number for your device that allows third parties to know. It's kind of like a cookie, but it's like a super cookie. You can't delete it. It's persistent to the device. We're seeing some pressure to deprecate that or remove that from the device, but we're seeing a lot of incentives on the side of advertisers and, and app makers to circumvent those uh, that deprecation and find their own solution to track uniquely because they want to be... Let's um let's come back to the UDID sure. and, and the unique identifiers and the cookies things. I, I, Ashkan has um, done this presentation. What everything I know about mobile privacy in 30 minutes, which is like a huge crunch, um, and we just asked him to do it in four. So yeah. <laughs> we'll unpack a lot of those things going For sure. forward. But let's go to Sarah, um, sure. Sarah Hudgens. Hi, good morning, thank you. And I'll try to jump off where, where Ashkan was going, but just to give you a little bit of background, the Interactive Advertising Bureau is comprised of uh, more than 500 of the leading media technology publishing. Uh, sort of the 
the entire ecosystem, essentially. Everyone who has a point in that uh, value chain and contributes to the uh, great content and technology that you consume today is one of our member companies. And so this is an incredibly important issue, and it drives to the heart of that. The other part of that is, by some estimates, you know, we are expecting that more people will access the internet through a mobile device than a traditional desktop by next year. I mean, you think about that. Smartphones are prolific. Tablets are really kind of not, they haven't reached a saturation point, but by the end of the year, we're going to see a lot more competition, and that will also increase in that field. And then we had our first super phone come out, I think, this month or, or is expected to be released in the next week or two. So we're really talking about an entire new uh, marketplace and ecosystem, and that's important to our member companies in order to provide that rich content. And how they do that is, is through online advertising, and they make up more than 86% of the online advertising you see today. And so one of the things that's very important to that is, of course, consumer trust and uh, brand trust. And how do you do that? Well, consumer privacy is an important piece or a component of that. And the industry has already made that commitment when you think about uh, the Digital Advertising Alliance, of which the IEB is a member. We have a long-standing commitment and a successful self-regulatory program for online behavioral advertising and multi-site data. It was recently endorsed by the administration uh, this past January or February. I might be mixing up the date a little here, but we've seen a lot of success with that program, and it's really based on some key principles of education, notice, and choice, giving the consumer control, essentially telling them what the practices you are that you are doing, and then giving them the option, the choice to make their decision based on that. Because what we found is that privacy means something different to everyone, right? I mean, Tim mentioned this. How do you define privacy? Well, Consumer expectations for privacy are so varied that you have to be able to do it in such a way that you inform the consumer of what is happening and then allow them to make that decision. And so what we are aggressively working on doing, because the mobile marketplace is so key to our industry and the future of this space, is working on building out that digital advertising alliance program to the mobile space. We're incorporating principles that target exactly the uniqueness of the mobile ecosystem. So as Ash Khan and Patty both mentioned, there are some very unique differences within the mobile space than the desktop. So for example, new parties, you have the carriers, the OS, the ANSET uh, manufacturers. We're now dealing with um, a different environment for application developers versus what a mobile website browser does. We're also talking about a device that's with you all the time. You carry it everywhere. Apparently some people sleep with it. I don't want to know who you are, but you, know, you keep that to yourself. There's a lot that can happen that you are doing on that mobile device. You're banking on it. You're talking to friends. You're doing emails. You're taking photos. And so along with that comes that data, as well as things like where you are. Um, it can be location. It can be precise or hyper location. Uh, we now have issues of applications sharing data with each other. We have uh, issues of data moving across applications to websites. And so how do we control that? So the DAA self-regulatory program, which I'm pleased to say we should be able to announce uh, by early summer, uh, is looking specifically at those issues. How do we address making sure and, and understanding that location information can be more sensitive? How do we make sure that we provide consumers the notice that that data collection is happening and give them the choice to either you know, consent to that or to opt out of it? Uh, similarly, when you're talking about things like personal applications, you know, email, calendar, address books, you know, we, we saw the PATH episode where it was released that it had been culling address book data. Well, of course, I think it's common sense to all of us that you should know about that and you should consent to that before that practice takes place. So these are important things to look at and address. We, we do believe that the industry will be able to come uh, and rise to the challenge with that and with our self-regulatory program, but we're certainly... Uh, still working on that, and it's an evolving ecosystem. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, so we've talked about um, the, the mobile space is very personal. These devices are personal. You sleep with them. Uh, app developers code them in their underwear at night, <laughs> as Ashkan said. Um, so I, I think Ashkan was saying that not not to be pejorative to app developers, but um, Todd, since you are an app developer, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, is there anything to that? No, but I just wanted to uh, just ask you, like, from your perspective as part of the ecosystem, how do you view these things? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Todd Moore, and, and I started a company back when uh, Apple first opened up the App Store and gave, you know, independent developers like myself the opportunity and, and the chance to innovate and, and create apps. And, and it's, a, it's a market I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed, and, and I'm worried about it. And uh, I think everyone is. That's why we're here. 
Um, privacy is a big issue. And so I guess I'm here today to, for one to represent um, the developers that are that are out there. I'm also a member of the Application Developers Alliance, and which is attempting to unify the voice of uh, developers so that we are heard. Um, I have a lot of strong opinions when it comes to privacy, not only as a software developer, but as you know, consumer of hundreds of apps that I use all the time. And I, I think what's interesting is we do need a set of best practices um, because everyone's doing it differently. Uh, if you look at the Android. Uh, phones. They implement security and privacy completely different than uh, the, your iPhone. And uh, it's just completely different mindsets where on the iPhone, um, there is isolation there. Uh, I don't have access to various things on your phone. I can't get to your voicemail. I can't read your text messages. I can't get to your call log. So in, in some regards, Apple does a really good job at isolating uh, that kind of access from third-party applications, which I think is great. On the other hand, uh, they allow, right currently, full access to your address book and your calendar events. And I think, you know, in, in, uh, with the news of PATH coming out and exposing that it was uploading your address book, you know, these are important things. We should be uh, notified as a consumer if, if an application uh, requires that level of access. Uh, if you look at the Android market, uh, the, they list out all the permissions that the application will use um, uh, up front before you install it. I think, I think that's a good solution, too. It's important to know that. But uh, from, my, from my end, I can tell you I have an application uh, that's very popular that plays um, sounds. And, and one of the things that you want to do as a... Um, as an app that's going to play sounds is when the phone rings, you want to turn that off so the person can take the call. Well, I have to ask permission. I have to get permission to read the phone state and the phone identifiers and all this other stuff. And, and it's too much. I don't want that level of access. So right there, it fails on the Android side because a lot of consumers will download my app and be like, why are you asking for those levels of permissions, even though I'm not using them? So from a developer side, that that too, even though it's great that you know that I'm using something, but um, you could interpret that, and it often is interpreted by customers, that that could be malicious activity. So there needs to be something more. There needs to be a chance for me to explain you know, this is why I'm requesting this level of access and this is what we're doing with it. Because, you know, I like to think of, uh, you know, when you buy a candy bar, you, what's in it? You look at the ingredients. Is it bad for me? And that's kind of what the Android market is trying to do. But sometimes the ingredients are just too generic and you need to be able to tell the end user, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And certainly a privacy policies and all that is great, but nobody reads that stuff. So it needs to be easier. I, I like what I'm seeing um, from from the iPhone side of things as far as location. You, you have to answer yes or no. Will you allow this app uh, access to your location? I, I think that needs to be extended possibly to other things like your address book and your calendar. Um, I, but I also think you should be notified at point of installation. This is what the application is going to do. These are the libraries that the application is using. These are the uh, things that, uh, you know, like you were saying with the wallpaper app, if it's going to you know, access your address book and, and your network, there's something wrong with that. So I think if, if I can at least, the reason I'm here is to kind of give you, um, uh, from my point of view, from a developer's point of view, and, uh, in regards to both platforms. So I write apps on both Android and iPhone. So um, I certainly have some opinions as to what I think it should be. And, and to be honest, I think it's a mix between what I'm seeing on Android and, and iPhone today. So um, as I said in my opening, I think you have these, you know, Congress is obviously going to be holding hearings. The Senate has one coming up next week, I believe, on, 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 on privacy. Uh, there's been ongoing hearings in the House. Um, the White House has called for legislation. The Federal Trade Commission has put out its report that includes some some aspects of legislation, but all of them are urging um, hate, uh, you know, best practices to be developed very quickly. And, and you know, we have some really huge open questions. And I'm not I'm not trying to be obtuse. I mean, the fact is, we don't even we're not even sure what privacy is. 
Uh, we're not sure what just-in-time disclosure should be. Um, you know, how do, how do we do this? Uh, the question, one of the big questions is, what is privacy? And I, I know that's really a trite, often, you know, discussed term. But in defense of, in defense of the wallpaper app, uh, I personally would have no idea where to buy wallpaper. I, I don't have a single clue. Like, I don't even know what store would sell it. Um, but if I was looking at wallpaper in an app, and, and they were able to tell me, well, there's a wallpaper store, you know, a mile from you or from a mile from your house, I'd kind of be, I'd, I'd think that would be interesting and they'd have to know my location for that. So um, the, the privacy aspect of this is, is really interesting, so it's hard to tell. Um, you know, if they ask me up front, why do you need your location, why do you need, and I don't know if they actually do this in that app because I don't have it, but um, the question is, it's, it's really kind of tricky. Ashkan? So... I think you can, I, I've said this before, I think you can think of privacy as surprise management, right? So, so making sure that people are, and, and people are on board with what you're doing and, and what your app does and what your advertising does. And it's a difficult thing to do. We're talking about really complex new ecosystems and different levels of understanding with regards to the underlying mechanisms. Uh, but I think, you know, we can put incentives on the side of the people who develop apps and develop platforms to make sure that, you know, the entire gang of people that use these platforms are brought along and are not surprised by the functionality. And if you f just frame it like that, I think we're, we're, we'd find that a lot of the issues, right, in the case of Path, I think if you asked users whether or not uh, they, would be, they would expect a social network app or they would allow a social network app to access location, most users would be fine with it. It's more about the uh, app kind of surreptitiously reaching in and grabbing location. Okay, so doesn't doesn't that you know the surprise management aspect of disclosure doesn't doesn't that kind of fly in the face of what Patty was talking about as just in time disclosures? Um, back in the day, in kind of the PC web browsing world, we talked about giving consumers notice at or before the time of collection. And you're saying that maybe doesn't work in the mobile space? Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm saying so. so whatever the the best mechanism to make sure that people are understanding what uh, what is happening is and put that in but put that onus on developers right so th think of cars right so there's some set of information that goes in the glove box which is the the you know the manual that nobody reads and there's some things that go on the dash that flash when you need oil or when you need to do something at the, you know don't don't put it in reverse while you're driving really fast that kind of stuff um, and it, it's dependent on the car you have whether it has four-wheel drive you, you have different options uh, but it's up to the car maker to make sure that the important things are prominently displayed at the time that's important and people aren't surprised and they don't go blowing up in their car, right? Patty? Um, and by the way, um, I was just tweeting that you were speaking and your your autocorrect um, name on my Android is Patty Possible. So oh. you're going to you're going to need um, wow. you're going to need that for doing this <laughs> workshop by in May 30th. Wow. Uh, wow, that's a lot to live up to. Um, <laughs> and I do want to say I, I realize I forgot to say it at the beginning that my views are my own views. I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission. So. Um, I, I just want to follow on to what, what Ashkan was saying, because the, that principle of unexpected, um, not surprising consumers um, is discussed in our report about, um, in the privacy report, as you talk about commonly accepted practices. So the idea of this is, you know, for things, if I'm, I'm purchasing something and they're filling in my address to ship something to me, I probably get that. And I don't need tons and tons of disclosure to explain that to me. But tell me the things that I might be concerned about if you're going to give that address to somebody else or um, it's, it, it's going to be used in some unexpected way. So the report does list out several commonly accepted practices that, that um, companies, that, you know, fraud prevention, um, let's see, fraud prevention and um, remember there? Secure, fraud prevention, security, uh, product fulfillment, those types of things where um, yeah, you probably don't have to have that same level. But instead, so don't clutter up um, my notices with lots of all of those kinds of things that I might expect, but give me the things that I might care about um, at the time that I'm making the decision. Well, if I could just add to that, too, I mean, one of the things is, is striking the right balance with notice, right? You know, I, I think it does need to be upfront, you know, when you're making that decision. Um, or when that event is happening. Not necessarily every time you open your application, you're confronted with a notice because what's going to happen is the consumer's going to stop using that application. I mean, we, we all are aware of this. You know, it's annoying when you know, your browser tells you it wants to send back information for reporting and you're, you're constantly clicking no, no, you know. I, which that information is helpful to the browser to, to improve your service, but when it's repeated, right, you're less likely to use it. So making sure there's a right balance on the notice. The other part of that is, is, is sort of that what you were getting to is, is what is privacy and what do we expect in terms of um, 
what we expect for notice and disclosure. You mentioned girls around us or girls around me application in, in the description of this panel. And if I could, I'd love to use that as an example. So I think privacy is incredibly subjective. And when you're talking about an application like Girls Around Me, for those of you not familiar, it, it was an application that would cull uh, information from Foursquare check-ins. And if you had linked your Foursquare account to your Facebook, uh, possibly your picture would pop up. And you could be in a given location and see what women were around you at that given time. So for me, personally, subjectively, on the creepy scale of 1 to 10, that's a, a 10 creepy. But take it out of that context in what that application itself did. So Foursquare had an API that allowed that information to be culled by this application. So people were publicly posting where they were. This is You have to stop and take a step back a little bit here. People are choosing to alert the public that I am currently at Starbucks right now and that they have also uh, set up their settings to link it to their Facebook page so that their photo and their information is there. Now, they should have been alerted that this application or that there was a possibility that that information was being shared with other third parties to, to create that circumstance. But we can't be quick to demonize this system and set up because there's potential future products and services that people who have lesser privacy expectations and are willing to force that or to hand that information over might enjoy or appreciate from that service, right? So if you're at a conference and you check in that you're at the conference and you want to network, well, maybe there's an application for that. So things like ambient social networking that, that are coming out um, here in the landscape, we don't want to be so quick to pass judgment. I do think that when on its face you look at girls around us, for me subjectively as a consumer, that, that really you know, bothers me and, and hits my privacy scale. But I think there are other people who might view that differently. And so really the question came down to telling the consumer um, and providing them the option and the setting to control that. I can just add that uh, that particular application, uh, although very creepy, there's other apps out there that are currently doing it, and, and it's, it's perfectly acceptable, I guess. Um, take a look at Banjo. Uh, they display the same information. They don't filter by gender, but uh, it's easy enough to, to make that filter your own because they show you know everyone who's around you. And I think it just brings up the point, what is wrong with... Um, you know, displaying publicly available information. That's all that application did. Yes, it's creepy, but so who's at fault for that? Well, I think the, the people that are posting their GPS locations publicly, they're the ones at fault, and I think you, you, you have to educate them. And, and I think that comes from Foursquare, that comes from Twitter, that comes from Facebook. Uh, all of those uh, social networks need to have uh, better controls and, and uh, properly educate uh, those who are posting their location, uh, what that means. Because if it's out on the internet, anyone can grab it and scrape it and display it in, uh, display it in different ways. I think this is where that, that notion of context comes into play, though. I absolutely agree that it's public data and everyone can access it and, and display it. But I think um, in the, we can try to exercise some manners with regards to app development or, or data display that I think will help facilitate as people come on board and start to realize that this might be what they're revealing, uh, helping uh, you know, the ecosystem by exercising some manners or some control. So the path example is a good one, and I've used this example before, which is um, the operating system allows access to contacts. Right, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone should just go in and reach for it, right? And and, and how you navigate this with notice is like how you would navigate someone coming to your house uh, as as a guest, right? If that person reaches into your fridge right when they walk in the door and takes a soda, you might take offense, right? But if they asked you for a soda, you would probably hand it over to them without any concern. If they kept asking you every day they came over for a soda, you'd be like, stop asking. I already said you could grab it, just grab it. But if you hadn't seen them in a couple months and they come over and they reach into your fridge un unannounced, that might be problematic. I think exercising these manners helps bridge this gap between where people are at, right? So with, dr with girls around me, why not to go further and make drunk girls around me, right? So you could 
monitor the frequency of check-ins at bars on Foursquare and try to estimate blood alcohol content and then mash that up with hot or not to only match up with hot girls and then you know I think you can get more creepy and more problematic with public data I don't think it should, it should be a justification though. well I think I think um, it begs the question about um, you know how do you find creepy or as um, Robert Scoble likes to call it freaky um, apparently that uh, for a man that's freaky for a woman it's creepy um, it, it could be a gender difference here but um, I've actually heard privacy advocates say that girls around me is a very good thing. Um, it's the, the new vanguard of consumer education. Um, back in the day, you know, you'd say, well, we need these tips for privacy. Never disclose your personal information to someone you don't know. Things like that. They are meaningless today in the mobile marketplace. But an app, if developed uh, to educate, like if I don't think that was their intent um, to educate, but it actually has educated a lot of people about what they're sharing, how they're sharing it, and you, it's, a, it's public API. You're putting this information out. It was cobbled together, and, and wow, it, it rose to the level of uh, hit Sarah's creepy meter. Um, is, is this type of, um, these apps, the new vanguard in consumer education? Patty? Um, I, I think it's, it, it did illustrate a, a point, and it has illustrated a point. But, and, and I think what we're talking about is uh, what, what we have been talking about. It, I just want to make sure we delineate between the two. So it's one thing for the com consumer understands what they're posting publicly and what they're sharing publicly. But a big piece of this is the invisible collection um, that consumers can't see and can't understand. And I want to make sure we, when you talk about the two, making sure that there are, there are differences there and making sure cons there, right now there are a lot of things that consumers cannot possibly see. Well, we're, you know, we, we might talk about the folks who think they're publicly posting and they may or may not understand how much, how those settings worked, but the stuff that they can't see that's being collected and shared um, is, is, an, is a, a big piece of this. And I want to make sure we're not mixing the two. Just real quick, we, we had um, Please Rob Me, right? Do you guys remember that one? Where I was monitoring your Twitter stream to tell you who you should rob. And that was a proof of concept app to show kind of the vanguard in consumer education. I think girls around me, the guys were actually serious about the app, which is different. Um, so, so yeah, we've had this kind of thing. Real, just real quick, the person tweeting on uh, Neck Caucus, you might want to put a period in front of their, your replies so they're not at replies, uh, so that they go out publicly. Speaking of education, so I, <laughs> <laughs> educating on Twitter, uh, you know, I, I think Patty makes a great point, and you know, distinguishing between, for example, the, the public information as well as um, the information that you're not necessarily seeing, the things that are happening in the background. There's a lot of great opportunity for education through so, similar to what our self-regulatory program does. Right, so what we hope to do is enable um, very similar mechanism as to what you see today. When, when you look at the desktop and you see an advertisement, and there's a little blue icon in the upper right-hand corner, what you're able to do is to mouse over that icon and get a brief description of, of what is actually happening. Because you may not be aware that there is a third party on that website. You know, today you're on MSNBC, but you know, uh, value click is on that website as well it has dropped a cookie and is collecting information about your activity well what that does is enables them to serve targeted advertising to you and so what you're able to do is learn what those practices are what's happening and then if you wish to go further and then opt out you can choose which companies you want to opt out of or click out to opt out all of them and so what we hope to do is to transfer that over to the mobile space. Now, technologically, there's some very real differences. Uh, notice and disclosure, there's some very real differences. It's a small screen. I don't know how many of you have noticed, but the advertisements in your free application are usually about, you know, yay big. So how do we uh, give you notice of what practices are happening? That's something that we're aggressively working on uh, to figure out. But what it comes down to is the ability to disclose to the consumer that, yes, these practices are happening, this is what's being done with your data, and then give the consumer the choice uh, how they want to respond to that. And so I think that's very important. Now, there's also a very different and sensitive information that uh, a consumer may need enhanced notice of, may need more options than just choice. It, it may be more of a consent uh, structure, and, and that could be um, when, when you're looking at precise location information or per personal applications. Um, furthermore, it, also giving notice that the data isn't just being collected within your application, but across all your applications, or possibly across your applications to your mobile browser. And so that really comes down to the issue of the education, is how do we educate consumers that of the hap uh, activities that are happening, let them know when it's happening right at that moment, uh, and then give them the choice to exercise. 
Um, I have one question I want to ask before we go to questions, but I have like three more questions in, in case we don't get questions from the audience. Before I go to questions um, from the audience, I, I wanted to ask um, Todd, um, I hear all the time, and even on this, a little bit of this panel, is this question of like, what's really different here is you have these software developers, unlike in the old PC space, right? You have these software developers are like dudes in their underwear in their bedroom, you know, hacking, you know, typing away, or these very, very small organizations. Um, and there's a uh, implication that there's a certain cluelessness or lack of sophistication um, with regard to these people. And this is this is why the software is being written that doesn't re isn't really sensitive to uh, the the fair information practices of limited collection, collecting only what you need, uh, proper disclosure. Uh, do you think that's fair? Do you think? That, and, and again, I'm just generalizing what I'm hearing here in the city and in public policy circles, is that fair when it comes to the entire ecosystem? Um, well, I will say uh, I don't code in my underwear. I don't know why we keep bringing that up. <laughs> but uh, I, it's, my, my concern here is that you're putting too much on the developer to, to handle uh, everything that we've been talking about today. And yes, there's going to be uh, applications that were written by uh, people that probably you shouldn't be downloading to your phone, and that probably exists more on Android in, in terms of uh, malware because there's no review process. At least with Apple, there's this perception of a walled garden. At least some human has looked at the application and has verified that the feature list does, in fact, represent what the application is doing. But I think that gives a, a false sense of security as well, so that has its own issues. Um, I, again, I, I, I really want to stress here that I feel uh, there's three components here. There's one, the end user who needs to be educated no matter what. Uh, the person that downloads the app needs to understand privacy and what it means to post information on the internet. Uh, two, the application developer uh, shouldn't be held uh, completely responsible as to what the application is doing. There's, say, there's measures that could be put in place by uh, the platforms, and they have, and it does sort of work. Again, I'm going to bring up the example of uh, the Android market is great because it tells you what types of uh, libraries that the app is using. Um, and, and I think uh, the iPhone does some things right by shielding out your, your phone calls and, and your uh, voicemail and your text messages and, and completely shields uh, app developers like myself from getting access to that. But they don't uh, there's things that they're dropping the ball on. Once I agree to location, uh, apps then have complete access to my photo roll. I, I think that's that's wrong. Um, I don't think I should be able to download your address book and upload it to the internet without your permission. These are things that can be fixed by the platform. Um, again, but we don't, like we were talking about earlier, we don't want our phones to constantly nag us either. We don't want a Windows Vista uh, issue on our phone where every little thing the app does is, is going to prompt for, uh, you know, can, can it do it or not? So there needs to be some balance between both. Once you install and download an application, it actually tells you these are the modules and components uh, that the application use, and we need to provide a level of education so you can make a good decision on that. And two, when, when apps are using your address book or private information like that, there should be some type of notification. Uh, currently, there is not on the iPhone or Android that um, your phone is using uh, your address book, or you, you'll, see, uh, you'll see network activity, but you don't know what's going on. So I think, um, I think to, to say it's up to the application developer is, gonna, is, is, is great, and there is a lot of responsibility there. I'm not trying to get out of responsibility. Um, I'm just saying I would feel safer as a consumer if, if more safeguards were in place on the platform itself. To Todd's point, I, I do think he's right that we can't just sort of put all this baggage on the application developers. This is a shared responsibility for everyone in that ecosystem. And while we need the application developers to step up uh, and we need to continue educating them, I do think it's a noble effort to assume that we can get every single app developer who's creating something every day to make sure to have the right manners, to make sure to have the right policy effort. And so it does have to be a shared responsibility. It has to be the application developer. It has to be the third party the application developer is using to help monetize that application. It has to be the carrier, the OS, the platform, go down the entire chain, the analytics. So in that case, you know, that's where our program comes in because we are 
uh, working with all those parties. You know, we have the carriers, we have the OSs at the table, we're talking to the platforms, to the handset manufacturers, to make sure that we can all be part of the system. And, and again, to focus on the practices, right? Not the parties or the technology, but to focus on the actual practices themselves. Because at the end of the day, this has to be a consumer-facing effort, right? It has to be as simple as possible and easy to understand for the consumer. And then on the back end, we can all work together to figure out how to do it the right way. And so that I think Todd's absolutely right that we can't just throw this baggage completely and exclusively on the application developers. Patty, and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, I was just going to add too that it, isn't that where you have something comment, Ash um, Isn't that where uh, having some established standards or, or best practices that are uh, that level the playing field so that if if we have uh, the app developer doesn't have to figure them all out. The smaller guys don't have to figure everything out, but they know what to do because there's been um, some set standards and it levels the playing field. I just want to push back on, so I absolutely agree that it's shared responsibility, but in terms of th that notion of consumer facing, the application developer is in the best position of everyone in the ecosystem to understand the, the consumer expectation and manage that. The, the platforms themselves, like app, that's actually a, a misnomer, Apple doesn't review every single app that gets into the app store by a human. They look through the application, but they don't black box the application and they don't check the data transmissions, right? Um, the, the relying on uh, what the platform provides as, a, as an excuse has been a cop-out we've seen time and time again in the browser space too when people say well the, the browsing browser platforms provide the ability to set flash cookies so we're going to actually just use it it's not our fault it's the platforms I think that's actually a cop-out we wouldn't hold uh, UPS responsible for screw up with, that we ultimately purchased from Amazon I don't think we should re rely on the platforms or the underlying mechanisms as solely the people I think the the developers are in the best place to to handle these kind of these these kind of surprises uh, as an example, I was playing with Instagram last night, and uh, Instagram, they just got acquired by, by Facebook for, I think, a billion dollars or something ridiculous. When you take a photo on Instagram, um, and th the photo starts transmitting instantly to, uh, maybe it should, you should know because it's called Instagram, but it gets sent to Instagram's servers instantly before you select any of the sharing options or you hit done. Right, and so that uh, that's something that happens under the operating system. As an app reviewer at Apple, they would say, "Well, this is to improve performance." Obviously, that you know they've disclosed that in some way. But I think most people would find that surprising, right? They would f they they might take some picture and decide they don't want to share it, but it's already uploaded to the servers, right? So those type of decisions, the app developer is in the best place to manage those kind of gaps and surprise that most people wouldn't expect. Um, I'd just like to bring up the point uh, that people are going to write malicious applications and those applications are uh, have the sole purpose of stealing your identity and stealing your information so uh, we're obviously not going to be able to control what they develop and you know if, if Apple you know revokes their developer license they'll just register another company or register another entity and so again I uh, to to just rely on the application developers to say that they're in the best position I think is is incorrect. I, I think you're going to have people that are going are purposely trying to steal your information, and uh, I agree that Apple does not uh, check for anything malicious. They do check. They do static analysis of your application to see if you're using uh, function this. calls and API calls that you're not supposed to be using. So that's a good step. But uh, again, malicious code is always going to be out there. But we're not that, talking about malicious code. We're talking about Instagram. We're talking about girls around me, which got through the App Store. But we're not talking about rogue applications are often obviously pulled from the App Store. And there's a lot of work. Google has announced Gatekeeper for the same purpose. We're talking about the good players that are trying to play nice but, but are surprising consumers, just to clarify. Okay. I, for me, I'm, I'm worried about malicious software. I'm worried that if I download a flashlight app, it's going to steal my address book and now everyone in my address book is going to be spammed. Uh, I think to me, that's, it's what the app is doing uh, secretly uh, without my knowledge. I think that's a, a bigger issue. Um, questions, Larry? And Larry, if you could speak up and identify yourself. I'm sorry we don't have a microphone.
issues. But the public keeps on gobbling up these apps and downloading them. I'm just wondering, where is the disconnect? Is it that the education isn't out there, or the people hearing these things from you now and saying, I don't care, I just want to work, I just want to be there, and you give them an electronic school, uh, we'll worry about privacy in the app. Uh, so, so for the, because we don't have a microphone, Larry's in for the camera. Uh, Larry's basically asking, is the tr uh, the trade-offs? Um, so, the trade-off is that we want the functionality, we want the value. We we have kind of kind of brushed aside the privacy concerns, um, and and that's the question. Well, I, I do think what at the end of the day we are dealing with um, consumers, and and consumers consume, right? Um, they make their decisions. Um, I'll also add that consumers are getting more savvy. You know, I, Pew did a, a research on social media and how consumers were uh, reacting to their privacy settings. And just in the last two years, it's more than doubled in the number of people who are reviewing their privacy settings and use, utilizing them and setting them. But that said, consumers are also reviewing them and then choosing not to activate them, um, which is a different and unique situation here. We're talking about consumers who decide that you know what, I'm okay giving up some of my information in order to either A, have this app for free, or B, to broadcast my information. Um, education still has to be there. I, I do think that we have to continue that education. We actually have a consumer education campaign that uh, we've rolled out with more than a trillion ad impressions to help for in terms of online advertising and targeted advertising. I think we do need broader, we need to continue that education piece and, and keep it going, but we are seeing consumers make decisions and often and increasingly informed decisions. Add too that our, um, they, I don't think consumers do understand. I mean, our, our report talks about there's a lot of data collection going on that, that's invisible that consumers don't understand and, and, and don't see um, and, and can't make a choice because they didn't realize it. But we also seen reports that show consumers are concerned about privacy. Um, but with in the mobile space, if you're having, if there's no, uh, for instance, in our kids app report, um, when we looked at the disclosures that were available for a parent trying to make a decision before they download an app, what, if, if I'm concerned about privacy for my kid and I want to download the app, um, we looked at the apps in the app stores and, and could found very little information available. And, and I think they, even if you're concerned, there's not much you could do to find out. Uh, what's happening with the app, um, let alone if you even understand some of the capabilities that Ashcon was describing at the beginning of this panel. If you don't even know what to ask for and look for, it's, it's pretty tough. And I think this is where the interesting public policy question comes in, right? So I agree with Patty that most consumers don't know the data flows off their app, to f especially to the third parties. Uh, most of those transmissions are invisible. But for the most part, um, you can look at to behavioral economics around this stuff, right? People discount risks in the future for intermediate gratification now. Um, people are tend, tend to kind of bias towards new shiny versus like kind of safety features. This is why we have you know, re legislation around seat belts or purchasing insurance, right? So if it came to like uh, you buying a car because it's fast versus you buying a car for airbags, only recently have we seen people selecting car safety, right? Um, and I think this is kind of reflected in this space as well, and how we address that is is a really good question. Let me let me see if we have another question. Uh, Baron.
So two questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Well, and I can't give the commission's thoughts. Let me be clear about that. These are my thoughts. So um, as for uh, the desktop versus the device uh, itself, and, and we're well aware that there's two, two ways to download, um, there's a couple things. So first, for the desktop, may actually be the place that a parent would look if the kid is holding the device and the parent wants to look. But even if that's not the case, we did look at, um, uh, if it's, first of all, by doing the desktop procedure, it was, it was certainly easier to capture and be able to look at a, a large, large volume of the, of the uh, promotion pages. Uh, but secondly, there isn't a, a big difference between the two, um, and we did look at that um, before we made that decision. But there, there isn't a, a big difference. The disclosures were not that different. There's a couple of them. We identify them actually in the methodology section of the report, um, but there isn't a huge distinction in terms of what information was available for parents uh, there that we could see. Um, and as to the second um, comment, the, our question about um, the disclosures and the, whether there, there might be some structure, I think what you're talking about is um, what we were, what we suggest in the report and recommend is that um, the, all the players in the ecosystem um, get together to to think about and figure out some ways to give uh, effective and meaningful choice to parents and how to give them this information. And we didn't lay out specifically you got to use this icon or you've got to put it in this place. Um, one of the things that we asked uh, for the industry to look at is what is an effective way to convey this information to parents and how to do that effectively. And that will be one of the topics that's part of this uh, privacy panel that's going to be at the dot-com workshop that's on May 30th. It's a free event. It's uh, in our New Jersey Avenue building here in D.C., but it also will be webcast. But there will be the panel that's on mobile privacy to talk about how do you effectively give disclosure um, on the mobile device. Okay. Um, if anybody, let, let's, I, I, I want to make sure that we have Jason Weinstein, Greg Nojime, and Sharon Franklin in the audience. Uh, we're going to do a quick transition after this last question. So if anybody has a question, uh, not in two parts, but just a question because we have a few seconds left. <laughs> Well, I think in, in that particular case, you know, one, I think that was where Foursquare quickly realized that this was happening, not realizing that it could happen, uh, pulled that API, and if they did know it was happening, should have disclosed to the consumers at the outset that in addition to making your information public, third parties may use this information and data to, um, in their other applications. And so I, I'm, I wouldn't argue that it's, it's particularly, uh, the onus is completely on the consumer in that situation. I think Foursquare quickly recognized that there was a situation here, and that's why they pulled the API so quickly. I mean, even if you pull the API, you can still get that information. I, I think it does fall on the consumer. Uh, all that he's doing is taking publicly available information and putting it on a map. I don't understand why. Uh, granted, creepy. It's not some, a business I would ever get in. But again, there's other apps that do it. Banjo does it right now. I mean, it's publicly available information. So it, it has to be education to the consumer in that regard. If they don't know that they're posting their information for the world to see, that's a serious problem. I was just going to say, too, as part of our privacy roundtable review, um, one of the things one of the reasons that we wanted to do that or that uh, staff thought it was a good idea was because of the incredible um, uh, increase in computing capacity and the ability to, to um, capture and hold and, and hang on to for years and years lots and lots of data that can be used in, in lots of different ways. And technology has just taken off. And um, whether consumers understand that, that that data can be around forever and ever and, and keep being reused and, and processed in real time um, is a, is a is a big issue. 
Yeah, and I, 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 again, disagree. I think as digital citizens, developers and people that use this data could just take better practices. There's a lot of creepy things you can do in real life, and we just don't do them because, or you know, people look uh, badly on them, but we can't do them at the scale we can do some of these other practices. And as someone that facilitates this technology and uses this information, I think just some cognizant responsibility on uh, how people might feel about the use of this, their information, I think is a good starting point as well. So developer manners, basically. And that's fine. Uh, you can post those best practices, but what you're going to end up is uh, you're not going to have a standardized anything. So you're going to have a lot of different apps, a lot of different developers all doing their own thing in different ways, and it's not going to be standard. It's not going to be consistent. Um, and that, that's a problem, and that's why I think uh, the platform makers, uh, whether it's Foursquare or iPhone or Android, they're in the best position to create a standardized solution. Well, I, I, I are obviously really interesting questions. We really don't have enough time to like, we could have spent hours longer, but that would torture everybody. Um, we have Jason Weinstein um, from the Department of Justice on the next panel with Sharon and, and, and Greg Nojime. I'm going to ask them to start moving towards the panel table. I want to thank you know the, the, all the panelists. Ashkan's going up to, to New York to speak. Uh, your, uh, Sarah's going down to New Orleans to speak. Um, Patty, you have your May 30th uh, disclosures workshop. That's going to be really interesting. I encourage you all to go. Um, and, and Todd is, is, is local, just, just hacking out apps, right? So I, I want to, uh, definitely not in your underwear. Um, and I want to thank everybody for, for participating. Thank you so much.